This episode of Bulletproof Cashflow is brought to you by Realty Dynamics. Learn how people like you can build substantial passive income while creating wealth for the long term through real estate investing. Visit rdyne.com. That's r d y n e.com. Well, you and I both know when we put a valuation on this, it's based on the income, it's on the net operating income. And so in a cap rate, it's a function of that. That's all the lenders use and appraisers. So if I'm buying it based upon, you know, a market cap rate and the NOI of those buildings on three acres and there's two left, I just got the land for free. And so now I go in, fill it up, raise rates. And then when I'm full again, then we're building buildings, building out, you know, two more buildings on acres four and five. You know, that is the value add. Working because you want to, not because you have to, is financial freedom. And we want to help you create that. Welcome to the Bulletproof Cashflow Show. We're going to teach you how to achieve lifetime financial freedom through real estate investment. Your host is a multifamily syndicator and property developer. He's done deals reaching into the hundreds of millions of dollars. You'll hear from experts in all aspects of real estate investment, finance, finance, development, and management. Everything you need is right here. This is the Bulletproof Cashflow Show. And this is your host, Augustino Pintus. Hey everyone, it's Augustino. On this show, we often explore ways to find bulletproof cash flow. Now, multifamily is not the only way to generate money from real estate. Today's guest knows this. Just like me, he believes that real estate is the best possible investment and self-storage is his preferred asset class. Now, he began investing in single-family homes a long time ago, but soon he moved to multifamily investing, and but still didn't see the economies of scale and the simplicity that I was really hoping for. And this is what led him to self-storage, where he found that the management process is way easier, much simpler, and the typical benefits of real estate are still there. They're still present such as appreciation, you get the cash flow, you get the financing options, you get all that great stuff. Now today, he owns and operates over 22 facilities in nine states. Additionally, he leads a community of owners, developers, and investors who partner on these types of projects nationwide. Now with all that, I'd like to welcome my good friend, Scott Myers. Scott, thanks for coming on. Augustino, always good to catch up again, and uh, thanks for having me. You bet, you bet. Now, guys, like what Scott has to say, you can reach him via the contact page at selfstorageinvesting.com. Okay, Scott, go ahead and tell us a little bit about your journey. Yeah, so um, like you said, got into real estate the way that many people start, and that is uh, with a single family house. And and, and going way back, uh, Augustina, maybe some of the folks will remember Mr. Carlton Sheets. Um, that's uh, we turned on the way back machine. That was uh, watching his uh, on cable, his infomercial, and I bought that home study system and uh, brought it in. And you know, I know the, there's a lot of people giggling out there, but you know what? If you put it into practice, it works. I mean, it's all about the execution. And so I did. Uh, you know, I read through it. Followed the steps. We bought our first single family house using an assumable mortgage, a VA mortgage, which are almost um, you know, obsolete uh, these days. I mean, you can find one, good luck. And we assumed that mortgage, uh, used the equity in my own personal residence, uh, took out a home equity loan and uh, purchased my very first house. And then before the Burr method was the Burr method, you know, we rehabbed it, so refinanced it, rented it out and took that cash and then we doubled it down. We got two more properties just like it. And, and as you mentioned, then we, we got into multifamily after that. That's kind of a natural progression that people get into just to try to get that economy means to scale. But, you know, it really didn't. We didn't find ourselves, uh, my wife and I, you know, having that the additional cash flow and really the time and the freedom that, um, well, well, the Carlton promised, you know, uh, on the infomercial. It just wasn't coming true in real life and in practice. And so what we did is, um, you know, with all those uh, additional units, and we had about 500 units, over 500 units that we were managing. Yeah, it was just you know, additional headaches. And so we never got to that place, Augustino, and uh, maybe it's our own fault, but, you know, we had property managers and then we had property management companies, but at the end of the day, you know, there's, there's still, you know, the buck stops here. We still had to write the checks and, and I still just continue to be disappointed in my fellow man for trashing my place and not paying me. And, and so, you know, that, that was just not fun. And so as we looked around the real estate landscape, um, you know, there's either, you know, if you don't, if you want to be in rental real estate, income producing real estate without tenants, toilets and trash, there's, well, parking lots and, and there's uh, self-storage essentially and a couple other one-offs here and there. But uh, you can't really build a lot of value in parking lots. And so I begin to look into to, to self-storage and 
you know, kind of, I held off because at the time, and we were talking, this is back in 2005, you know, it was just a, a, an unsexy form of commercial real estate. And, you know, we were, we were climbing the ladder and, you know, we were building this portfolio of multifamily and that just sounded so much better to, you know, discuss with friends and family. Uh, but when I begin to look into the asset class and, you know, peel back the onion, you know, you recognize this, this industry has been around for a while. It is a virtually recession proof, inflation proof. It has the lowest loan default rate. When people don't pay you, we operate under the lien laws versus eviction laws and habitation real estate. And somebody doesn't pay, you simply put a lock on their unit, you lock them out. And after 60 days, you auction their stuff off and you recoup a portion of, in some cases, almost all of our back rent and late fees. And so when I began to look at this, I thought, gosh, is this, is this too good to be true? Um, is this real? And then the more I dug into it and learned about the asset class, um, I bought a facility in a partnership and then we were off to the races. I, I went off on my own after that, sold all the houses and apartments. And um, along the way, began to build up a portfolio of self-storage facilities. And then or that we began teaching people. I, I used to run a real estate investor association here in Indianapolis. It was uh, the largest in the, in the city. We had 600 investors and they all, you know, because I was the president, they all wanted to know more about self-storage because that's what the president's doing. And so I, I held a workshop and so uh, then I held another and another. And as uh, we were talking in the green room, you know, that kind of took on a life of its own. And uh, some of the national agents found that uh, there was actually a guy teaching about this because at the time I, I learned on my own. There wasn't, you know, an organization. There wasn't really anybody teaching about it. And so um, an education company, and then really now a, a media company was born. And so we had two 60 hour a week businesses in, in self storage, both my investment company, as well as the education company. But um, yeah, as you and I talked uh, uh, offline, yeah, we, we kind of scaled that back. And now my focus is on, yes, teaching people about the business, but only strategically so that um, we can partner with these folks. And, and that's what we've done now. And uh, very successfully co combined the two businesses. And we have now over 2.6 million square feet of storage. We're now in 13 states, uh, about 170 assets uh, under management. And, and we really operate now all, almost more like a, a financial services company that raises private equity and deploys it in self-storage. And so we've gotten really good at that along the way. You, you kind of have to if you're going to grow uh, any business uh, and bringing in private equity and partners. And uh, we just got back uh, literally two days ago uh, I got back from a trip over to the Middle East. I was in uh, Dubai and also in uh, Saudi Arabia and um, in the region, Bahrain, and um, talking with family offices over there, different venture capital firms. And it uh, turns out that, um, yeah, self-storage has now become very sexy here in the U.S. And it's uh, really attractive uh, to folks over there as well. So uh, we're looking forward to 2023. And there's, uh, I think I've used up my 60 seconds of my, my, my bio. <laughs> it's a, but it's all right. That's all good stuff. You know, I think the thing is, is that for... For many folks, um, especially recently, I'd say probably in the last, I don't know, eight, nine years, mm -hmm. everybody was pushed to make this huge push into multifamily, much bigger than ever before, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so I think now self-storage has become the sexy the sexy mm -hmm. asset class because there's so much cap rate compression that's taken hold. Yeah. I think back, I think I recall reading somewhere that back back in when you started buying this stuff, you're talking like 10, 11, 12% cap yeah. rates. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. very strong, strong investment. Yeah. But to your point, it's like, it was also very unsexy, um, yeah. kind of boring. Nobody yeah. really understood it and they didn't want to understand it. And that whole, right. the whole concept of, of, of building, building wealth the way that it is today wasn't really there either. Cause I think it was, right. it was different times too, right? Mm -hmm. Very different times back then. Yeah. Well, you know what's sexy? Cash flow is sexy. Cash flow is <laughs> very sexy. Come around. <laughs> That's right. Cash flow is very, very sexy. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Hey, Augustino here, and I would love to connect directly with you. Text the word books to 844-428-1344 to receive weekly book recommendations from me. So, so let's talk a little bit about, about the benefits of storage. You already touched on some of them, right? And mm -hmm. I think that not having any tenants there is, is phenomenal. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. hey, listen, you know, I do multifamily primarily. So that's our, that's our primary bread and, bu bread and butter. Mm -hmm. We also do development. And the, the net lease business is especially mm -hmm. interesting to us yeah. for the reasons that you just pointed out. With our single tenant mm -hmm. net lease asset, mm -hmm. corporate guarantee, we're not worried yeah. about, you know, any, any reason why Dollar General is not going to pay the rent this month. They always pay right. the rent, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. to your point, especially in the C-class band of assets mm -hmm. and tenants, mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. folks are under a great deal more pressure today, mm -hmm. hard to get rent out of these folks sometimes, you know? So mm -hmm. 
self storage doesn't have these problems, right? So mm-hmm. uh, you, you touched on some of these things. Can you dig a little deeper on, on some of the other the other benefits when it comes to the self storage mm-hmm. uh, asset mm-hmm. class? Yeah, I don't I don't want to paint too rosy of a picture because even in the class C assets and in, uh, in self storage, um, it's a little more challenging when those folks fall behind on rent. But again. You know, we've got that, that that carrot that we dangle out there. It's more of a punishment than a carrot that, yeah, they're going to lose their stuff if they don't pay. And so, you know, that alone usually gets rent in. And, and, and it's easier for us to be able to manage to a level that is um, far below what was ever considered, ex- you know, acceptable in, in, in multifamily. Uh, but, you know, we just instead of that one single dollar general tenant, um, the downside to that is that, you know, we have multiple tenants. You know, we have two, three, four hundred or so. They're clients they're customers, not tenants. They don't live there, but you get it you know, that we do need to make sure that rent comes in. Uh, now that's mostly done by way of software and we have uh, automatic, you know, hits a debit card, hits a credit card, ACH. And so we can manage that uh, uh, effectively. But uh, that is the one piece that was a little bit different when we went into self-storage that was just a little more challenging until we got a, um, you know, a handle on that. But outside of that, the benefits of, um, you know, when times are good, you know, we as Americans, we buy more stuff. We are the hyper consumers of the world. And we need more storage. Average home size in 2007, before the Great Recession, was 2,200 square foot in this country. And then after the recession, it was a 1983, so just under 2,000. So we're, uh, you know, 200, 300 square foot smaller houses. Um, Our appetite for buying stuff and consuming and having things still hasn't uh, changed. And now we're we're a society that is more transitional. And so we are buying smaller homes. We're doing more um, tiny houses to condos, to apartments, and being a, in more transition-based housing than, than permanent housing these days. Uh, you know, the, the generations that are coming up now, they, they want that ability without a lot of stuff in a yard um, to be able to just move to different parts of the, of the country. And that necessitates a need for storage. And if we're living in smaller spaces, then yeah, the millennials, um, everybody worries because the boomers, you know, they were good at having two houses and they had boats and RVs and all this stuff. Well, you know, millennials still want experiences as well. And they, they have camping gear and they have kayaks and bikes. And if they're going to pack up and go backpack across Europe for six months, well, they're going to put their stuff in storage when they give up their lease or rent out their condo. And then when they come back, they'll grab them back out again. But even while they're there, you know, they're, they're an experience-based um, society right now. And so we do have stuff and toys for experiences and so the demand for storage has never been greater in, in our country right now. So the, the downside um, when, in, in the, when the economy hits in terms of a recession um, is nothing but upside for self-storage because then people downsize. They may, if they've lost their jobs, they move in with each other. They move back home. Businesses downsize. They, you know, they put their business equipment into storage until things turn back around or inventory. You know, people start up food truck businesses, so they become Amazon drop shippers or by default, you know, eBay uh, sellers. And so that all necessitates another need for storage. And self-storage is the cheapest you can find around per square foot. And those that are starting their businesses, uh, you know, Starbucks and your kitchen table and your garage only last so long before everybody starts complaining. And, and, and you can operate out of a self-storage um, unit and um, do your work in the morning uh, at a Starbucks or where have you. But then uh, the rest of your business is done out of a storage facility. So for that, and so many other reasons, but really what it boils down to, Augustino, is it's a simple, predictable business model that we are still, the demand has, um, the supply is not caught up with the demand in this country right now, and it is absolutely on, on fire. And uh, we are raising rates on a regular basis. We don't have annual leases. Our, our leases are 30 days, which means every six months, seven months, depending on, upon occupancy, we're raising our rates and pushing that, that value. And so there's just a number of reasons why we, we love the asset class. Um, very safe, very secure, lowest loan default rate, lowest loan loss rate. Banks love this asset class. They want it on their balance sheet during a recession and funding is not an issue for, for all those reasons. Um, it is outperforming all the other asset classes. And and again, no offense, no offense to anybody investing in, uh, assisted living or multifamily or mobile home parks. Um, the stats are just there and in in our economy right now, it, uh, it is the asset class that is doing the best. Hey, you know what? And there's nothing wrong with having investing in multiple asset classes when you're yeah, absolutely when you're doing multi or doing real estate at large mm-hmm. i mean that's why we do development we do multifamily mm-hmm. we do new yep. lease it's it's kind of like i'm not going to call it spreading risk because these are fairly low risk type of assets yeah but, but it's um yeah it's diversifying you know but you're diversifying it in one asset which is real estate you know and, yeah, and something right. something you said though was, was was interesting is that the, the growth that's taking place in the self-storage world mm-hmm. and when I was doing my research on self-storage, I found that 
self storage often followed multifamily in terms of one hundred percent, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and there's this huge growth right now, even in multifamily today. When we're building, of course, we have uh, five projects just in this in this city alone, right? Uh, mm -hmm. About a hundred million dollars worth of stuff that we're building. Yeah, and um, the the self storage uh, facilities. There's some down here downtown. Enormous, enormous uh, sh shops. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't, I can't. And they're all full. They're all yeah. full. It's, yeah. it's it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, it goes hand in hand. I mean, you know, when I begin to explore the asset class, uh, coming from multifamily, you know, a lot of the comparisons for underwriting and the way that we evaluate them are very, very similar. Um, although self storage does a, have a handful of nuances to it that you know you need to get a handle on, you know, as you're running, operating, and evaluating self storage facilities, but um, very comparable in terms of an asset class. And yes, we follow. I mean, you know, you're looking in, in your development world. You know, you're looking to, to follow the pipelines, you know, where's everything going? Where, you know, the path of progress, you know, you, you want to get ahead of that and, and housing is going to go there. And we like to see in a market, one of our demographics is 25% or more of a, a market within, say, a three mile radius. That's what I determine a market for a self storage facility. 25% or more of that to have uh, to be multifamily uh, of the units, residential units there. So we're constantly looking at multifamily, where they're developing, you know, what that looks like. And, and, and once you see a number of multifamily um, developments uh, come up, I, I, I can all but guarantee you're going to see a storage facility within a three mile radius of that or two or three facilities, depending upon, you know, the market and the saturation and the supply index um, in the market at that time. So 100%, um, you're, you're right. Uh, they follow each other. They run in tandem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's going to be my next question right there is your approach to finding new markets, right? Certainly it sounds like multifamily definitely is one of those things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, just from just my experience, just driving around, noticing the, 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 the self-storage facilities that aren't doing so hot, there's nothing around there. Like there's no multifamily anywhere around there. It's usually like in a farm area, like a tertiary market in the middle of nowhere. There's a, there's a facility with no multifamily. Um, but I was explaining this to a friend the other day, actually, that self-storage is a business on its own. Like it's yeah. not, it's not necessary like a roof over your head, right? So mm -hmm. picking, it sounds to me like picking your market is a, mm -hmm. is paramount. It's you, you got to pick the right market, and um, I mean, how do you do that? How do you how do you define yeah. where you, if you're going to build something? How do you figure out where to build that aside from looking at the multifamily stuff? Yeah. You know, uh, Augustina, we, we love this asset class. When I got into it, um, only 10% of the industry was um, owned and operated by the REITs. So the public storage, the life storage, Cube Smart, Extra Space, you know, the ones that everybody's familiar with, the big brands, the REITs, the Real Estate Investment Trust. Um, now we're at about 20%. Um, but the, so the good news is, is that 80% is still owned by the mom and pops, um, which means that we have the ability to go into these secondary and tertiary markets and find those. Now, when, when the industry started, the mom and pops that are out in those areas that you just mentioned, the you know tertiary markets that are on the farm fields, back in the day, you know, in the 70s and early 80s, you know, build it and then they will come was kind of the, you know, the story of the day and, and, and folks could build it and there, was, there wasn't anything around and people would travel, you know, five, seven, eight miles if they, to get to their stuff, if they needed to put things in storage. Well, now, you know, competition has come in, there's a lot of infill. And so those mom and pops, if they're not running things right, you know, if they don't even, you know, there's some that believe they're not, don't even have a website and you got to have a, you know, a website if you have a business and this is a business to your point, it's not a hobby and people need to find you. And so those that are still left out there that are struggling, either competition has come in and they're able to be found and they're just running the business like a business rather than a, a hobby. Um, or those folks that are, that are in those outlying areas. Yeah. They just didn't do any feasibility study. They didn't do any market research at all. And they just put it up and hoped that people would come and <laughs> that doesn't always happen. You know, if a, if a market is declining in population or if it's just been stagnant, then, you know, that was just a, a bad call and, and maybe it's no fault of their own. You know, there wasn't anybody to do a feasibility study at the time because it was a, uh, an industry that was in its infancy stages. So to answer your question, yeah, we've, we've come a long ways. And now, you know, we've got metrics and we look at a market, um, you know, if we're in downtown, you know, in a you know major metropolitan statistical area with high rises and, you know, very little infill locations left, you know, the ones that you mentioned that you see in downtown, they usually have taken over um, a building that was, a uh, did not, uh, wasn't popular for apartments, wasn't popular for condos and, and nobody wanted it. Well, then the storage facility folks uh, would buy it because the dollar per square foot came in line but we would still do a market study to see if there was enough demand within a one mile radius in a downtown area. That's usually a, a metric that we use. 
a benchmark um, across the country. And again, don't hold me to this, but eight square foot per capita is usually where supply meets demand. And so you, you plot me down anywhere in the, in the country and any MSA and, you know, we'll do a demand study and, and, and do a supply index study and, you know, see what that looks like. And, and if it's saturated, if it's a way beyond that, and um, if they're not full and, and rents are, are being, you know, compromised and they're offering specials and we know it's not a strong market. It, it will, once you get outside of the downtown MSAs and to the secondary markets or suburbs, it's a three mile radius, eight square foot per capita. We do our studies, look at the, the rental rates, and then it just begins, you know, from a development standpoint, it's just a math exercise. You know, what's it going to cost to build this thing at 85% occupancy? Am I rental rates in the market right now? Does it cover the cost of construction? How long is the lease up? Am my interest reserves and my lease up reserves going to be in the way? And what's the valuation when I exit a five, six, seven percent cap rate? Um, I, I, you know, and I make it sound simple, but I, I know you're tracking and your folks are as well. It's just we go into those markets and that's the exercise that we do over and over and over again. But my point is, is it is a very simple, predictable business model if you know the benchmarks, the baselines, and, and what to hit. And, uh, and we do, and it's not that difficult to find out in a particular market. I want to take a pause from today's show to share something that I've been encountering. As I speak to many investors, there's this concern. And the concern is centered around the inflation we've been experiencing and the devaluation of our currency. Now, we've seen some of the highest inflationary periods over the past 30 years. That's up over 8%. Economists actually believe that inflation is closer to 20%. Some say it's even more. Now, what does this mean for you? Well, it means that money that is sitting in your bank account or self-directed IRA that's not invested in physical assets that hedge against inflation are losing buying power. That means that every minute, every second, that dollar is becoming less valuable. You see this every day. You see this in the groceries you buy, the gasoline you buy, everyday items that you're buying on a daily basis are becoming more and more expensive and you're using a less powerful dollar to buy these items, meaning that dollar is losing value and if it isn't put into a property that produces cash flow, just like real estate does. Now, our team here at Bulletproof Cash Flow has put together a series of weekly webinars that cover real estate investing like multifamily, net lease, and real estate development. Now, these are purely educational webinars. In these webinars, we talk about why real estate offers a powerful opportunity right now and why it makes sense to invest in these assets today. So if you're interested in real estate or want to have the opportunity to get involved as a hedge against inflation yourself, I encourage you to go to bulletproofcashflow.com slash webinars. That's bulletproofcashflow.com slash webinars. Now you go there, these, these webinars are 45 minutes and they cover different topics every week. We go over the things you need to know to avoid some of the common pitfalls when it comes to investing while getting you prepared to invest your paper dollars into a real physical asset. Now, if you can't make the webinars, just go ahead and register and we will send you a recording that you can watch at any time. And by the way, these webinars are entirely free. There's no cost to you. This is just something that we do to educate, educate our folks out there. So if you're enjoying this episode, please like and subscribe uh, to Bulletproof Cashflow. It helps the channel tremendously when you do. Now let's go ahead and get back to the show. Yeah, well, it's, it's all it's due diligence is what you just described, right? It's just really yeah. uh, doing the due diligence upfront. It's kind of like when we do our due diligence on multifamily, different set, different yeah. math equations, right. same no thing. Different. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. So I know you have this event coming up, yeah, uh, back in, in March. So do you go over stuff like this? Do you go over some of the some of the tactical aspects, or is it more high level? Yeah, as I as I mentioned, you know, we started this education business uh, many years ago, and we're kind of considered the black sheep of the um, uh, of the real estate uh, guru industry, if you will. It's because we're not gurus at all; <laughs> we're practitioners. And um, yeah, we we go through all this. Um, it's a three day intensive. It's a workshop. Where we go everything, uh, go through everything, how to find, evaluate, purchase, and manage self-storage facilities from uh, A to Z, soup to nuts. It's my team. And um, we show people just exactly how to do the market analysis, um, how to do the math, how to do the underwriting, and then best practices on, you know, how to maximize the NOI and, you know, force the appreciation and the value of these uh, facilities. And uh, that's what we've been doing for, gosh, now 15 years. Yeah. yeah. Well, hey, listen, I'm the black sheep guy too, just like you are, because <laughs> I'm a practitioner. I actually do the deals personally. Yeah. I'm getting the financing personally, all that stuff. So yeah, it's, I don't really consider myself. A We're a rare breed, my friend. <laughs> right. 
That's right. That's right. That's right. We don't just say we have thousands of units, and you know, never, never actually closed a deal before. So yeah, it's pretty funny. A lot, a lot of those guys out there. There are a uh, lot. Th- that's another show. Yeah. But, uh, but so, so I think, but I imagine uh, when you're looking at deals, yeah, you're gonna have the same problems that we have in the multifamily side in terms of the brokers. The brokers are often. Uh, what I tell my students anyway is that the OM is 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 marketing propaganda. It is not based on reality, right? So, yep. how, how, I'm assuming in, in your world you see the same sort of thing. How do you separate out? How do you really know the the broker number mm-hmm. from what is real? Yeah. Yeah, not not all brokers are created uh, equal, uh, and therefore not all offering memorandums are created equal. I mean, you know, the good smart brokers that have been around for a while they recognize first of all that it's a it's a marathon, not a sprint, and they're not going to have many clients if they continue to you know push these LMs that are nothing but fluff and you know hopes and dreams. You know, there are some of those out there that you know they'll take a listing. And the seller says they want a million bucks for this facility that's worth five hundred thousand dollars, and you know, then they'll list it and then get a whole bunch of offers at five hundred thousand and take it back to the seller and say, well, you know, here's what the market's saying. Do you want to sell it at this price? You know, th- there are those out there, you know, and, and they'll they'll put that together the OMs that, that that are fluff, and you know, here's what your here here's what your year ten <laughs> you know numbers look like, you know, when you've held this for ten years, you may achieve a seven percent cap rate return. <laughs> you know, um, so there are those folks out there. Uh, it's all about managing expectations, seller's expectations. And the good brokers out there will do that and they'll say, well, you may want a million bucks for your facility, but it's only worth 500 grand and here's why. Um, nobody's going to, you're not going to get an appraisal and you're not going to get the fine. The, the buyer's not going to get the financing on it. So we got one of two things to do here. Um, you need to be realistic with your price and list it at 500,000 or come back a year from now and stop putting money in your pocket um, instead of listing it on your P&L and you need to raise rates and you need to drive your expenses down and then when interest rates come down and the stars align, um, you know, with a with a good cap rate and a stronger NOI, maybe I can get you uh, seven hundred thousand for this facility. That's what the good brokers do. And in between that, um, you know, we just we have to sift through it. And and many times, uh, you know, obviously, same thing as you when you look at these uh, OMs. Sometimes we can see with a, a broker that may not be very good at um, maybe finding the the gold in, in the hills, and, and we can understand. You know, we can see some of those. But the rest of the time, we're working with the brokers that they know us, they know what we're doing, they know our buy box, and they've only got solid listings. And you know, we do get that preferential treatment. And uh, whether it's a, a a pocket listing or even if it's something that they're marketing internally, you know, the big brokerage houses they'll market it internally first, and we get those calls too, and say, "Give me forty eight hours, and I'll get an offer to you, or else tell you why your your price is too high, and 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 help you out, but keep them coming." And, you know, we, we do have those relationships, uh, which, you know, folks, uh, make sure that you make those and you treat your brokers well and, and uh, they will bring deals to you just as long as you do what you say and you have the ability to close uh, pretty quickly. So those are, I don't know, I don't know if those are tricks or strategies. It's just really our experience after a number of years in the business is uh, how to handle the brokers. I mean, they're, we're competing against them. We're, doing, we're, send, you know, we're, we're sending direct mail out. We're calling the sellers ourselves. You know, our acquisitions team is, you know, trying to beat them to the punch. And at the same time, you know, there are partners, you know, they're bringing deals our way. And when it comes time to exit, you know, we'll have them list it um, because they, you know, they got the pool of buyers that we don't have access to as well. So it is a, uh, it's a, it's a, always an interesting relationship, but uh, we love the folks that we, that we continue to work with. And there's some other folks out there that, yeah, you know, we, we, we don't love them. And so we don't work with them. You know, it's funny. There's so many parallels. It doesn't matter what the asset class is. Mm-hmm. The broker, the broker scenario is the same, right? They have their yeah. inner circle first, and they go to the next circle, the next circle, and then of course. at that point, mm-hmm. if nobody from these three circles buys, then it goes out to the market, and yep. that's they're They'll trying to find anybody. Yeah, correct, see. yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. Try to find someone that's going to overpay for. It. You know, yep. that's essentially that's essentially it. So yeah, same same thing, same thing. But I think yeah, of one of the things you said, but one of the things you said was absolutely critical that needs to be reiterated is always treat your brokers well. And oh my gosh, what that and what that means is like I, I ask any any broker. Brokers are probably listening to this right now that I have never busted the chops of any of my broker friends, and I call them friends because they really are friends. Oh, I think you're making too much money on your your um, your fee. Reduce your fee. I've never asked them to reduce fee ever, mm. ever. You know, you're paying for quality. That's why, you know, mm. so, um, and, and you'll find that when you do that, the broker will always kick you the best deals they get. They know you, they sh- you should never do that. And I, and I know some folks, obviously, you, know, you probably do as well, that, you know, they're bringing their other broker just to do them a favor and they'll say, hey, listen, you can bring in this deal and I'll help you with it. And, you know, they get 3% and the listing gets a 3%. And I would never do that. And when I approach these folks, I'll say, listen, you know, 
I'll, I'll, I'll do the underwriting. You know, if you got a if you got a pocket listing, somebody that's got a you know the mom and pop that's got a shoebox full of P and Ls, you know, that are base you know barely P and Ls, and you know the thing is is awful. You'll never get an appraisal, and you, none of your lenders will probably land on it, and your your buyer's pool probably isn't interested. Send it my way. Piece, I'll piece together whatever we got, and I'll get you an uh, offer in 48 hours um, or so, and it'll be a cash offer. And I'm not going to bring any broker in. And I'm, uh, I, you know, may, if you want to discount your commission because I, I basically do the OM, do all your work, that's fine. But I'm not going to ask for anything else at that at that point. Just keep the deals coming to me. And that's, you know, anybody who does anything opposite of that, you're just shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah, yeah. very very short term thinking. Very short term mm-hmm. thinking. Doing it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so in in a multifamily space, and even in a single family space for that matter, there's this big emphasis on value add, especially in that C class, B yeah. class asset, right? So, and when it comes to self storage, mm-hmm. what sort of things are you looking for where yeah. for the value to apply the value add component to that formula? You, you know what I love? Well, what's music to my ears is uh, when I'm walking through a facility with an owner that says. You know, we're at 90% occupancy and uh, we haven't raised rates in 10 years. And that's the reason why we always stay full. And I just, I love that <laughs> because uh, there's a value add, you know, they've fallen behind their 20% or $20 a unit, you know, below the rest of the competition. You know, even if they got a crummy facility, they're crummier than the rest. They're uglier and doesn't have security or anything else. They only need to be five bucks less than everybody else. That's it. You know, they're leaving money on the table. Um, they may not have a website. They may not be marketing well. Uh, the value add, a- anything that we buy must be value add. That's just our, our model from the beginning. And from the beginning, we look to find those facilities that are, say, a, a, on a five acre parcel and there's only buildings, you know, they built it out on three acres or maybe four acres and there's still room to expand. Well, you and I both know when we put a valuation on this, it's based upon the income, it's on the net operating income. And so, in a cap rate, it's a function of that. That's all the lenders use and appraisers. So, if I'm buying it based upon you know a market cap rate and the NOI of those buildings on three acres and there's two left, I just got the land for free. And so now I go in, fill it up, raise rates, and then when I'm full again, then we're building buildings, building out you know two more buildings on acres four and five. You know that is the value add. Um, renter's insurance, ancillary income streams, selling locks, boxes, and moving supplies, bringing in a U-Haul agency or any of the number of other truck rentals where we're just we're just an agency. They park their trucks there. We take no inventory. You know, our manager on site just fills out the paperwork and we get a commission and we get the rentals uh, from that as well. You know, there's a number of different ancillary income streams you can add to storage with a minimal cost and minimal time to be able to force the appreciation and the value. But uh, most of it is in um, just that, adding additional units, raising rates, pushing rates, and then also the implementation of technology. You know, we're, we have several facilities now that are unmanned. We don't have any managers on site and they're run by a kiosk. Um, you know, this is <laughs> um, our software, our websites, um, people rent uh, with this now. And they can move into their unit with a, a code, a key code. They bring their own lock um, or we have a key fob depending upon our facility. And, um, you know, it's like a Starbucks. If you got the app, you can walk in and, you know, grab the coffee and leave because everything was done on, on the app. And we have the same ability in a storage facility. Everything's done on the app and they bring their key and they got a key code to be able to get in and, and point to a map uh, where their unit is located. And we don't have to have a manager working 30, 35 hours a week um, or a manager and a half like some of the larger facilities. And, you know, we cut that payroll out, which goes directly to the bottom line. And, and again, we all know the power of the cap rates. You know, that's how we build value into these facilities. That's right. Love it. Something you mentioned was uh, about building out multiple, multiple, I guess, um, uh, what just units, I guess, on, on yeah. additional mm-hmm. acreage, yeah. right? So, so I, I'm assuming then before you actually make the buy, you're checking for zoning, you're checking for permits, for you're you're mm-hmm. you're looking for all those sorts of things. Have you ever run into any issues where? You want, to, you want to try to expand and the city says no? No, if it's already zoned, it's already zoned. And so, you know, within the five acre parcel, the way it's plotted, um, I can build it, you know, unless there's some issues that says that I can because of wetland or something else. But if it's already been plotted and I'm asking for the plans or else I'll have our civil draw something else up to see what we can do. But they can't tell you no, you know, if it's already been zoned on that five acre parcel, period. Now, in some cases, we're landlocked. Um, we can't build anymore, but I'm looking at the plot next to me or behind me um, or across the street or sometimes even a quarter mile down the road, and we still annex that site. And the office is located at the main one, and the manager or the kiosk points them down the road and say, here's where your unit is. It's, you know, it's right down there. And, and in that case, then we just go through zoning just like you normally would with a new development. So, you know, what's it already zoned for? Do I have to get a variance? Do I have to get um, uh, permitting for uh, you know, approval for that type of usage? You know, what does that look like? But we're always looking for, you know, reasons to do so. And, 
and quite honestly, is um, you know, we do that at every site. You know that we take down every every new facility that we take down. If I do a partnership with say um, somebody that we work with or a joint venture, and it's in a market in which we only have that one facility, then we're immediately the marketing team gets on it. We're sending out mailers, calling other facility owners to try to buy those up so that we can get economies of scale or look to develop um, another facility within that site because then it all rolls up to the website, same district manager, operations, you know, everything else, you know, gets rolled up into uh, multiple facilities. So um, I think that answers your question. Maybe we took a, a rabbit hole. No, that's fine though. That's fine. I mean, one, one of the things that um, that I find in some other asset classes is that they're a very unable, they're unable to continue building, i.e. Mm. mobile mobile home parks, right? right? And those are very, very difficult to build for the zoning especially, mm-hmm. right? But I guess in, this, in the case of self-storage, it doesn't really exist. I mean, if there, I mean, there certainly is a zoning component there. Um, is. But I'll, I'll answer that companies. a different way, though, Augustina. There, there is. Uh, we do get some remonstrance because, you know, if we're, if we're coming in a new development or if we're going to annex a site, um, then yes, you know, they'll, they'll have a public hearing and, and the homeowners association or the other businesses uh, get a chance to come out and say, well, you know, we don't like these garage doors and, you know, we don't want storage facilities located, you know, right behind our subdivision. So there is that piece when you get into the development side, just like, Again, any other asset class, especially if the zoning is not already in place for storage, then they have the ability if we're looking to change the variance and, and build something. And they can also come in and say, well, we don't want, you know, multi-story and we don't want all the, the pole lights or, you know, we want wall packs. And the facade has to look like this or we want a six foot wall that's split block and looks nice to kind of hide, you know, things and, you know, no chain link fences. You know, so we have to we do have to go through some of that, um, whether we have to the zoning is in place or a variance or, or a permitted use. And then just to, you know fit within the, the zoning guidelines. So it's not a walk in the park uh, by any stretch. As a matter of fact, we we, we face opposition just because of, uh, and I mean this in a kind way, just the ignorance of, of storage. I mean it's it's a friendly neighbor. It's quiet. There's hardly any traffic. We don't use a lot of utilities, um, but we just need to educate the, the folks in the zoning department as well as uh, the, the neighbors when we get ready to develop. Yeah. Well, hey, it's similar to some of the things that we do too. Uh, mm-hmm. We we're actually we're. We're doing a uh, redevelopment of um, of an office building to multifamily, and we're we're going through all that stuff right now. And the yeah. city, you, I mean, I'm sure you've seen this too. The city has no shortage of ideas of how to spend your money to make it look the way they want it to. Right? It's it's, it's amazing. It's, it's totally amazing. It's great. Even you know? like marble inlay in the the uh, wall, and could you make those? You know, the fence, the gate that opens up, made you know gold by chance, or you know, when <laughs> to fit gold a chain has the city. Yes, that's right. It needs to be gold chain. You know, it's like yeah. it's crazy, it's crazy. <laughs> Um, I, I, but I would imagine that ever since all this COVID stuff happened, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of these, you have a lot of vacant buildings now. I mean, I, I'm assuming that, I'm, I'm guessing, some of those spaces now offer themselves potentially to self storage. Would that yeah. be would that be a safe assumption there? Yeah, retail took a hit, a major hit. You know, and retail's um, going to continue to struggle in this uh, country. You know, as more and more people are buying online, and that just you know, COVID just accelerated that. So. Uh, vacant grocery stores, you know, big boxes of all sorts, you know, they're they're just the right size and usually have just the right ceiling height where we can go in and, you know, double the footprint, add a mezzanine and, and a couple of elevators and then build it out, put the walls and doors in for self-storage. And uh, and in even single story or just, you know, strip malls um, can be, you know, uh, repurposed to, as self-storage. So, yeah, 100 um, percent. It allows us to now go back into those infill locations where they wouldn't let us develop before or they're just there wasn't any land to do a four you know acre parcel to build out single story self storage. But now the cost has come down per square foot of those multi story buildings and uh, we can get into those for pennies on the dollar, you know, so to speak, and uh, make our model work to be able to build those out and, and, and run them as self storage facilities now. Yeah, yeah. But and obviously the same sort of thing applies where if someone out there is listening and they do have or they do know of one of these places and might have a retail shop that may be gone, gone under, uh, going through the city uh, city code ordinance and all that stuff is yeah. still a big thing, right? Because you have to get it all rezoned. It is. I mean, it, you know, and they're, they're going to want, you know, well, they want retail to come in there. But, you know, if the retail closed two years ago and <laughs> nothing has come in, guess what, folks? <laughs> Nobody's coming in. So, uh they got to they understand you, you want this on your you know tax roll or, or do you want us to put a business in here and um, you reassess it and uh, get this thing uh, paying taxes again um you know so that's that's the approach that we take with them and and usually it takes that it, it takes a little while before nobody comes in before then the seller um if it's a bank lender or that company recognizes that okay now we need to offload it uh, you know then the price comes you know down in line with our cost 
to then make sense to be able to convert it and, and to match the rental rates in the market and be profitable. Well, that sounds good. So we covered a lot of stuff here today. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I do love the self-storage business. I really do. It's, it's a phenomenal business. But to your point too, you've been at this for a very long time mm -hmm. and it requires a very different uh, different type of, um, I guess, analysis, yeah. right? D yeah, different type different of skill set. set. Mm -hmm. Yeah, different mm -hmm. skill set. Yeah, yeah. So, so with all that we covered, what sort of bulletproof advice would you offer to someone listening today that maybe is thinking about getting into this game, maybe wants to try to build that skill set so they can yeah. do this on their own? What sort of bulletproof advice would you have for them? Yeah, whether it's self-storage or anything else, uh, folks, uh, don't you get the naysayers out of your life and anybody that starts to put fear and doubt, um, and no matter what it is that you want to go do next. So whatever that looks like, if it's self-storage, then go research it, go do your homework. Don't fall prey to uh, analysis by paralysis. Uh, and again, don't listen to the naysayers or the news about how you can't do real estate right now because of interest rates and all the bad things, um, you know, they're happening and the zombie apocalypse that may be coming next year. Um, understand what that the asset class is, no matter what it is that you're looking to invest in, and then learn about it. And really what it takes right now, Augustino, it's a lending is difficult right now. Get a partner, bring somebody in that's got a strong balance sheet, experience in self-storage or experience in whatever the asset class is that you want to invest in and do one with a partner first, or at least uh, give them some shares of the LLC so that your lenders, your private equity partners uh, see that um, you've got somebody that has experience in this that is at least guiding the ship or is at least navigating you through it. That's what's going to, you know, open a lot of doors and keep a lot from a lot of doors from shutting on you. So that's probably the best advice that I can give uh, um, to anybody out there right now, because you will be told no a lot. And it is difficult starting from scratch, but, you know, not with the right strategy and be willing to give up. You know, 100 percent of nothing is nothing. If you got a great dealer from, as you mentioned, Augustine, you know, if somebody has, you know, a, a vacant grocery store in their area, it's been sitting there for two years and it's a prime opportunity to convert into self-storage. Well, just because you get told no that you can't do it doesn't mean you can't bring somebody else uh, in and then split the profits, no matter what that looks like. Get the experience and then go off and do it on your own. Yeah, love it, love it. And I think people can also learn about this stuff too. You have an upcoming event, right? We do. Coming up uh, March uh, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th uh, in Dallas. And uh, head over to our website that you gave uh, earlier on, Augustino, selfstorageinvesting.com to find out about uh, our live event as well as uh, there's a number of uh, white papers and free resources to get you started to learn about the business, at least uh, to do a deeper dive. And um, our self-storage podcast, which uh, met you, we were blessed to have you on as well, Augustino, um, as well as a number of other guests. Um, that's, a, that's a great way just to, to continue the conversation. Uh, we're talking about self-storage over there on the podcast. Excellent. Excellent. So guys, definitely check that out. And I think, Scott, you're doing these events too, uh, multiple times a year. So if this even, if you're getting this, uh, this, this show after March, Scott does these, these things all the time. And I strongly suggest if you're not in the real estate game, get into the real estate game. Maybe it's multifamily, maybe it's development, maybe it's self storage, whatever it is, got it. You got to do, you got to. Now's the time. Now's the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, guys, we want to reach out to Scott, reach on via his website, as he said, selfstorageinvesting.com. Hope you got some insight on the self storage space. It's a very powerful space. It's a great way to get some nice, strong cash flow without the, the frills of, having tenants, right? Those tenants we all know and love. All right, thanks for tuning in, guys. I'll see you next episode. Take care. You've been listening to the Bulletproof Cashflow Show. We hope you've enjoyed the show. We know we had fun. Make sure to visit our Apple podcast page and leave us a five-star review. We hope you've gotten some useful and practical information from the show. For real estate coaching, events, and resources, hit up bulletproofcashflow.com. Till next time. No information in this episode should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Any investment opportunities mentioned on this show are limited to accredited or sophisticated investors. Any investments will only be made with proper disclosure and subscription documentation and subject to all applicable laws. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice.